for you today. I'm going to talk a lot about botanical dyeing. This podcast mostly is circles around botanical dyeing, sewing, and herbal medicine. And they usually go in that order. And you can find the timestamps in the description box if you are here only for the one section of that. So today's episode, we're gonna start off with the botanical dyeing and then the sewing. I have, I don't have a lot of new things. It's not really the time of year where I experiment with new things or make myself things personally because it's just kind of time for me to focus on my inventory for the holiday season. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I do have a few new aprons that are listed up in the shop and I'll, I'll show you those anyway. And then the herbal medicine part of the podcast is all about Hawthorne and Hawthorne medicine making. So we will finish up the podcast with that part of it. All right, I guess we can just um, jump right in with the um, the dyeing aspect, the herbal dyeing <laughs> aspect. I um, let's see. The last episode I did was all on the goldenrod, and this the first part of this episode is going to kind of spill over into that. So I went back and I went farther up into the mountains and came across a bunch more goldenrod. It was just everywhere. So I harvested quite a bit and I put it in the dye bath and um, cooked that down. Botanical dyeing as you will find, or as you already know, is a very slow process. It just sort of melts into what you have going on in your life. And so I chopped up all the plant material, just the goldenrod tops um, that weren't spent. They were still really vibrant and in bloom. So I chopped those up and put those in the dye pot, filled it as full as I could with the water, and then I um, cooked that down for a while. Just let it sit overnight, and in the morning I went out to the compost pile and I just pulled the bulk of the plant material out, put it in the compost, brought it back in, and started heating it back up. The day before, I had mordanted um, two clothing items and some cotton hemp jersey knit. So I pulled those out of the mordant bucket, rinsed them out really good, and put them wet into the dye pot. And my experience with the goldenrod is it picked up the color right away. And whoo, what a color. I will show you this first. Oh, I just realized I forgot to grab my clothing. <laughs> so I'll have to stop here for a moment and go get that. But 
I will show you this first. Look at the color. This is just cotton hemp jersey knit, mordanted and alum acetate, and put in the goldenrod dye bath for I think I cooked her down for a little while, a few hours, and then I just put it outside and let it um, cool down before I took it. So I always take my clothing sopping wet out of the dye pot and just hang it up on the line to, to dry. And then I wash it a few times in the washing machine. But isn't that beautiful? What a fabulous color. I'm just in love with that. And I'll be right back. All right, these are my clothing items. So this is um, a slip, just your typical polyester 70s style slip. I dyed that. And then this is a cotton, um, I don't know, like swimsuit cover maybe. Anyway, it's very thin. But this is also dyed with the goldenrod. So I was very, very pleasantly surprised. I just, I love this color. It's so, so happy, isn't it? What a fabulous yellow. And then, so next up, after the goldenrod was dyed, I went on a little excursion down to Libby. The blue elderberries grow probably about 60 miles away from my house. So I decided to make a day of it. It's this beautiful spot that I love to go, and it's far enough off the road, and it's down by the river. I just feel very comfortable there, and I love returning to this little stand of elderberries for medicine making. I gathered a lot of elderberries, and I made everything that I needed to make out of them. I froze some for future syrup. I have oh gosh, a gallon of tincture going and a gallon of elixir going because those are like already I'm out of elderberry elixir just kind of like that. So I'm trying to keep up, keep up, make more. Elderberry is pretty popular. It's kind of like the world woke up to elderberry, you know, <laughs> kind of like salves. Ten years ago, nobody knew what a salve was. Now, you know, People use them and make them themselves or purchase them and they're used all the time and I always have such nice feedback on that. But back to the elderberries. So I made my medicine and there was a lot of elderberries that maybe weren't um, prime enough for the medicine making. So those all went into a dye pot and I boiled those down, you know, kind of the same process as the goldenrod, cooked those down on the stove, put the mordanted clothing items in the bucket the night before, the next morning, same thing, out to the compost bucket. I strained the elderberries and I also threw the stems in. I figured, I mean, I had done so much de-stemming for all the medicine making that I just decided to throw the stems in. And so I don't know if that made any difference on the color or not, um, but that's what I did. So I uh, pulled, again, my wet, mordanted items out of the bucket, rinsed them really good in the sink, put them in the strained dye pot and ended up with, this is the skirt. And these again are dyed with the blue elderberries. 
Isn't that pretty? So I have this and I have this tank top. Yeah, I really like this color. So the elderberry was kind of fascinating and I um I look forward to doing to doing that again. It was very it just felt really good to spend the whole day to just have the day be about harvesting the elderberry and then to come home and make the medicine and with all of the pieces that I would have discarded anyway. I dyed some clothing items. That was really, that was really nice. I, I don't know that I really learned a whole lot about the elderberry except for next time I might pick some more that I bypassed harvesting because they weren't in the greatest of shape. So I might harvest some of those next year as well and maybe keep those in a separate basket or bucket for just specifically for dyeing because I really wished I would have had a little bit more berries to work with. And that's, that's the elderberry dye bath. Moving on to... So a few days went by and I um, mixed up another batch of the alum mordant and I just do the cold mordantine in a five gallon bucket overnight. I just put my freshly scoured items right into the bucket. I used to scour stove top and boil and cook down my clothing, my fabrics, but I've skipped that step now and all of these I scoured in the washing machine. I just washed them in the washing machine and put them wet right into the Morton bucket. And we, so I did that with the next round of fabrics that I was going to work with and I went and harvested um, a bunch of mug, no not mugwort, wormwood, very close to mugwort. Wormwood, Artemisia absinthe, and I got the newer growth part, the greener parts, got quite a bit of that, just kind of packed it down in the, um, the dye pot, and cooked, cooked, started cooking that again. Um, by this time, we've now had a fire going, so I just put it on the wood stove and let it just kind of not even simmer or almost simmer for a day, let it cool and did the whole strain thing, pulled the plant material out, wrung it out, threw it in the compost, brought the pot back in here, put the mordanted fabric in and um, oh wait no, I didn't. I'm getting that confused with this other one. <laughs> oh, sorry. I did an eco print first, and then I put it in the dye pot. So, how I did that was I I've done a few videos on eco printing. I get the tannin rich leaves and um soak those in iron, an iron solution, and eco printed this fabric, and then you steam the eco print, then I put it in the mugwort. So I made the mugwort dye, did the eco print, did the steam, and then put it in. Now in the past I've dyed them in bundles, and this time I decided to not dye in bundles, and I decided to unroll it and then put it in there. And let me see here. So it's looking like episode 
five and episode six, I cover eco printing in depth with actual videos of us eco printing. But this is how it turned out. Now this is the uh, wormwood dye bath and I did put a little bit of iron um, into the dye bath and just a tiny little bit and it really kind of grayed things up. The Artemisia dye wasn't very dark. It was like a very, very, very light, almost greenish gray. And uh, I just felt like it was going to kind of wash away. So I added the iron to darken it up. And as you can see, some of these eco prints turned out really nice. Like that one there, that's a rose. Some of these are from just on the river walk. I just went on a walk and picked a bunch of leaves, but didn't those turn out nice? I think I'm going to hem this up, hem up the corners, and just use this maybe as a tablecloth. That's my plan for this, I think. I don't think I'm going to make anything out of it to sell. I think I'll just use it as a tablecloth. Meanwhile, while all this was going down, I decided to do another round of mordantine so I could utilize my mordant bucket because I will use the same mordant bucket a couple of times if it's in, you know, within a four or five day period, I will sometimes add just a tiny bit more alum to the pot and not the pot to the five gallon bucket and I will then do another round of soaking. I've been kind of doing my dyeing projects in that, like do a bunch and then clean everything up and put it all away and then plan my next, do a bunch. So I'd gotten, I wasn't sure what I was gonna dye with, but it's fall time and there's just, there's plants galore. So it's kind of whatever you wanna gather. So I put my next round of fabrics into the alum, and that night we had a huge rain, not, not rain, huge windstorm. And we had like 40 and 50 mile an hour winds, which is, doesn't happen here very often. I don't know that I've seen it blow quite like that in, in a long time, we'll just say. So in the morning, I woke up and my entire yard was covered in cones off of the spruce tree. So these little spruce cones about this big were everywhere. And I was like, oh, perfect. Because I've read a little bit about like cones, pine cone dying, and I've seen a little bit here and there. And I was like, oh, this will be great. I'll give this a try. So I went out there with my bucket, filled my bucket full of the cones and just started cooking them down. Um, and it was cold again, so I cooked them down on the wood stove and oh, they put off the most wonderful smell. Sometimes, sometimes dye pot doesn't smell all that great, but these smelled so good. And they have so much tannin in them that I, feel like you necessarily wouldn't have to use an alum mordant. But however, I had already put my cotton hemp jersey knit in the alum solution because I didn't know what I was dying. I didn't know I was going to wake up and those cones were going to be everywhere. So I just went ahead and dyed that and I will show you that right now. That turned out very nice. This beautiful tan color might even still doesn't really smell, but though the smell was so nice. So this turned out just 
your basic tan color, I, I really like it. I think it's very pretty and it's dyed with spruce cones. So then I thought I would do another little experiment with the dye bath, the spruce cone dye bath didn't seem completely exhausted. So I thought I would throw something else in and not mordant it. So I washed up just a piece of cotton that I had, mainly as experiment, and put that into the dye pot. Now I, I wanted this to be a complete experiment. I wanted to use an exhausted dye bath, I wanted to not use mordant. I had older eco printing leaves that had been soaking in iron for a long time, a few days anyway. I don't know at this point, it's like four or five days later from the other eco print, the um, Artemisia, this one. So I decided. Just to completely experiment, I got some more leaves, I put them in the same iron solution, and I dyed this first, and it's, um, it's quite a bit lighter in color, and these are different fabrics, and this one was dyed first, you know, so I don't know that I will do this again. I probably won't use an exhausted dye bath. I will... Um, just get more cones and do it that way. But like I said, this was just pure experiment. And the eco print didn't turn out all that great either. So I definitely will not reuse the pot of eco print. I will just mix up a new batch. Some of the leaves turned out really pretty, but some of them not so much. They're kind of like um, fuzzy. And so this was an experiment that I probably won't do anything with. I mean, this isn't really pretty enough to, to make something to sell out of. It just was a fabulous experiment. There's a few little leaves on there. I might keep it around to do, make um, bias tape, possibly, and I want to make some just botanically dyed, uh, like, banners, and so I'll need to make the bias tape out of that, and that's probably where this will go, to that homemade bias tape for banners. And, but I'm really glad I did it. I mean, this is how you figure all this, all these things out. It's just by experimenting and uh, writing things down, keeping a little journal about what worked and what didn't work and what you liked and what you want to do again and what you don't want to do. I think I want to um, definitely die again with the with all of these. I don't know that I will die again with the Artemisia, maybe at a later date, but next year, definitely doing Goldenrod and Elderberry. And then the spruce cones, there's still a bunch all over my yard, so I just want to harvest those and maybe uh, tuck them away and use them for a winter, a winter dye project. And that's that. All right, aprons, aprons, aprons. Not much to show, but I did just list these three. And this is a butcher style apron, it has this adjustable neck strap. So it just pretty much goes on. And then you can adjust it accordingly. It has two pretty long ties that can go all the way around and tie in the front if you want or tie in the back. And 
three big three big front pockets. These are also made out of a thicker canvas stain resistant type fabric. So you can cinch this up as tight or as loose as you like. Comes around quite nicely, just ties in the back, and that's that. I've got three different fabrics listed for these. There's this medallion type fabric, or even really know what to call it. I have one in anchor. Nice anchor print. This is always very popular in Alaska. The Alaska people like the anchors. And then this is a nice floral that I really like. It's um, just kind of your basic floral canvas. And like I said, these are on my Etsy shop and on simplyjosephine.com. They are $47, and that includes the shipping. So, Hello, and happy fall time gathering. I am out here today collecting hawthorn berries. These are black hawthorn, Cragus de Glassy. Um, something like that is its botanical name. There's hundreds of different varieties of hawthorn from little crab apple size all the way to little tiny raisin like size. But they all seem to have a very large thorn. And they will let you know if you are being too rough. You will get scratched. These black hawthorn are just in a lovely everyday heart tonic. Um, everyday food and medicine and I love being out here and picking these today it's just such a wonderful fall afternoon these um, berries you want to pick them after the first frost but if the first frost comes late where you live you can always pop them in the freezer for a little while before you create your remedies with these but let's go back to the house and make some medicine. Bye. I thought I'd do another little clip here to show you what these hawthorn berries look like up close. They come in little clusters and the, hopefully I'm not too shaky here, <laughs> they have these large thorns. You can see that there. And they will let you know when they don't want to be harvested. But these are pretty friendly today. The elixirs I like to use in tea or cocktail making and I like to consume a little bit more of it than like a dropper full in the tincture. I would put probably a three tablespoons of this, two or three tablespoons of this elixir in a tea or add to a wild drinks cocktail. But I make this, so I made this, like I said, I made this in the spring, flowers, leaves, thorns, honey, brandy. And then in the fall, when the berries are ripe, I make the same thing with the hawthorn berries, which is what we're gonna make today. And then when both of these have, in, well obviously this is infused, this is ready now if we wanted, but alcohol preserves things for a very, very long time, so we don't have to worry about that. But um, I'm going to do the same thing with the berries today and let that infuse for a couple of months and then I will strain both of these 
and mix them together. And that is my Hawthorne Elixir. All right, well, we can go ahead and get started with this. I am going to step over here and wash my hands, and then I will be right back. So I generally go about three-fourths full. So this is going just fine. And then the elixir is typically, I think I might just use all of these. So an elixir is typically one part honey, three parts brandy, alcohol, brandy or vodka. You can use 100 proof vodka. It extracts more out of the plant material, the 100 proof does. I, um, it's recommended for fresh plant material. I'm going to use 80 proof though. You still get lots of good stuff from using 80 proof. I like to use 80 proof for the elixirs because they're more of a drink mixer or something you want to add to a be beverage. Whereas 100 proof vodka isn't very drinkable to me, in my opinion. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who disagree. <laughs> but. As far as I'm concerned, I like to make this remedy with brandy. It's just a little bit smoother and goes nicer in the tea. So, I, like I said, one part honey, three parts alcohol. I personally don't like things that sweet, so I am going to use a little less. A little less honey. I love this McLowry's honey. So I'm just going to give it a nice coat. Coat the top. Try not to make a big old mess here. And then add the brandy. So let's See, I'm going to use this part of the stick to kind of, of the spoon to pull that away so that the brandy can get down in there and we can give it a good shake. All right, I got my lid on there and it passes the shake test. It works good, so I'm going to keep continuing to shake this a little bit till the honey gets dissolved in there and I'm going to let this sit for at least six weeks before I strain it and I'll strain that and mix them together and have a fabulous remedy. All right, wrapping things up here. Thanks for watching and please if you have any questions leave a comment and sh please share this video on your social media or with a friend and it will help me get out there a little bit more. So thanks for watching and have a great day and happy, happy fall to you. I can be found over at simplyjosephine.com and I'm Simply Josephine on Instagram. Bye.